Human history reached a crucial period around 500 BC. Confucius and the Buddha in the East, and Socrates in the West, shone as brilliantly as stars. The three classical culture centers, China, India, and Greece, were taking shape. These thinkers and cultures still deeply influence people's ways of thinking and living. The German philosopher Karl Jaspers named this pivotal era of human awakening the Axial Age. China's Axial Age burgeoned during the spring and autumn and warring states periods from around 770 to 220 BC. Thinkers such as Confucius, Mencius, Lao Tzu, Chuang Tzu, Mo Tzu, Shun Tzu, and Han Fei gained prominence at this time. Later generations would admire what they called the contention of a hundred schools of thought. This was the most splendid chapter in the history of ancient Chinese thought. The Mencius Temple in Zhecheng City, Shandong Province. A coming of age ritual, the capping rite, is being performed. The senior man presides. And a hat resembling an adult male's is bestowed on him. For thousands of years, this statue of Meng Tzu, whose Latinized name is Mencius, has witnessed generations becoming adults. Mencius was a pupil of Confucius' grandson, Zhe Tzu. Although unable to take lessons directly from the master, Mencius always regarded himself as Confucius' direct successor. opening words of the three-character classic. For centuries, this easily memorized and illuminating text has introduced Chinese children to Confucianism. <laughs> Meng Shanju is the 74th generation grandson of Mencius. Meng <laughs> Zhenwei. The Meng Clan Association held a small-scale sacrificial ceremony at Youliang Temple in Kaifeng, Henan Province. They advised their ancestor that the temple would be rebuilt by later generations of the Meng clan. Mencius lived from 372 to 289 BC, a century after Confucius, and like him, traveled to various states with his disciples, offering his policy of benevolence to their rulers. Confucius had endured great hardship and danger in the states of Chen and Sai, but Mencius was well treated. The first ruler Mencius visited was King Hui of Liang. In the first dialogue between the two to come down to us, the king said, Venerable sir, you have traveled far. Are you provided with counselors to profit my kingdom? 
Mencius boldly replied, Why must your majesty use that word prophet? I have only counsels of benevolence and righteousness. Second only to Confucius himself, Mencius has been revered as a sage. Youyang Temple was built by later generations to commemorate him. King Hui of Liang consulted Mencius many times, but he was fond of waging war. Mencius' ideas of benevolent government, no widespread killing, mitigating punishment, and remission of taxes really appealed to rulers. Despairing of the king, Mencius said angrily that from a distance he did not look like a sovereign. He then left the state of Wu. After the memorial ceremony, Youyang Temple returns to tranquility. Mencius' devoted descendants carefully clean the courtyard. Most of the temple has been destroyed and the remains transformed into a factory building. Only two stone tablets remain. Yen Xinbang's late 17th century rebuilding Youyang Temple inscription and another from a century later whose inscriptions time has effaced. Perhaps dispirited by preaching to unheeding rulers, though with higher hopes for the future, Mencius moved on to the state of Qi. He wanted to reach the academy of the Gate of Qi in the capital city, Lintzhe, as soon as possible. East of the city's main axial road, during the Axial Age in the East, this institution, also known as the Ji Sha Academy, was the earliest government university in China. It was a center for political consultation and academic and cultural exchanges during the Warring States period. The most famous scholars gave lectures, exchanged ideas, and contended with each other. It became the most important locus of the hundred schools of thought. The rise and fall of the Jisha Academy is a topic that still stirred hearts centuries later. The renowned 20th century scholar Guo Moruo noted that the establishment of the Jisha Academy was of epoch making significance in the history of Chinese culture, which had developed to the point where academic thought could be freely studied. Of course, such social progress also promoted the progress of academic thought itself. Here, Zhou and Qin scholarship reached their peak. Shishuan 发表自己的政治主张,互相争名. Later generations referred to these scholars collectively as the Jisha school. In fact, there were several different schools, including Confucianism, Taoism, Legalism, the school of names, the school of the military, agriculturalists, the school of yin and yang, and so forth. The contestation between the hundred schools of thought was in some ways analogous to the political situation during the war in the state's period. In Qi, Mencius put forward a famous proposition. The people are the most important element in a nation. 
The spirits of the land and grain are the next. The sovereign is the least. Because this is the right name. The at the Jishan Academy, Mencius started a heated debate among the scholars. He attacked one of the most popular philosophical schools of the time, Moism. Mencius was from Zhoucheng, Mozart from Tangzhou. Their hometowns were very near each other and both followed Confucius' teachings. But their ideas were quite distinct, even antithetical. Mozart Memorial Museum in Tangzhou City, Shandong Province. Mozart's statue here is unique, with a rugged face whose piercing eyes gaze forward to the horizon, a simple bag slung over his shoulder and a wooden staff in his hand. He wears sackcloth and resolutely strides forth on his journeys. This is not the usual image of a refined, neatly dressed scholar. The museum is also different, resembling a showcase of ancient scientific and technological ideas and inventions. Mozart是用于手成，它是把石块或者是火球放这里，它通过这样的一个路的牵引拎出来，再通过支点的弹力把石头抛出城外，用来撒上成败的敌人。墨子说，圆一中同长也，是说圆呢，一个中心。Mozart was born in 470 BC, towards the end of Confucius' life, and died in 391 BC, two decades before Mencius' birth. Early in the Warring States period, he journeyed for ten days to the state of Chu. He urged the King of Chu to give up his plan to attack the state of Song and conducted mock battles against Lu Ban, a skillful craftsman engaged by the King. Lu Ban attacked and was defeated nine times by Mozart. Mozart had successfully defused a war by demonstrating his superb defensive techniques. Mozart学了爱了，学了学了人了，开始发现有问题，所以就出来了，就反对儒家这个人。你对人的这种爱啊，是由血缘关系决定的一种远近亲疏的一种态度。他认为这不行，人都是一样的嘛，既然人都是一
Moists obeyed the Grand Master's orders and followed strict laws. They opposed war and desired everyone to love each other without concern for their own interests or even for their lives. They submitted to suffering and observed strict discipline. All were enjoined to undertake matters fearlessly and vigorously in the interest of a cause or on behalf of a friend, without hesitating to lay down one's life if need be. This is why they were respected during troubled times. However, Confucian scholars disdain Roison's rejection of their own ideas about propriety. From the standpoint of 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 所以说后人甚至有人说墨子是黑社会老大这个我只能说就是很遗憾他们没有学到墨子兼爱这个思想的核心 was born later than Mozart and never met him but he knew Moism very well He attacked the idea of impartial love believing that it was foolish to dispense with propriety and not distinguish associates from strangers or nobles from the humble. Among the hundred schools of thought, Confucianism was the most fastidious upholder of the doctrine of the mean. Avoid extremes, attend to benevolence, righteousness, propriety and music, pursue harmonious order in the world, and promulgate these ideas to all. Mencius certainly did so, but like Confucius, he did not realize his political aspirations, and in his later years, he taught students and had his theories preserved in writing. Lao Tzu on an Ox, painted by Zhang Lu of the Ming Dynasty. Lao Tzu sits on a green buffalo, holding the scroll of Dao De Jing, the Book of the Way and its Virtue. He looks up at a flying bat, Lao Tzu was the founder of Taoism. Having met him in Luoyang, Confucius reportedly said that Lao Tzu was as unfathomable as a sublime dragon. Seeing the Zhou dynasty in decline, Lao Tzu left via Han Valley Pass. According to the biography of the immortals, the border guard, Yin Shi, saw a purple mist suddenly rise. Shortly after, Lao Tzu came from the east riding his green ox. Later generations would regard Lao Tzu as immortal and weave arcane symbolism around him. For instance, ideas such as a gentleman's ceaseless self-improvement, represented by a horse, could be linked with the I Ching hexagram for heaven and the creative principle Yang. His possession of virtue, represented by an ox, with that for earth and the receptive principle Yin. The border guard, Yin Shi, refused to let Lao Tzu pass unless he left some evidence of his teachings. Lao Tzu obliged with the work of 5,000 characters that we know as Dao De Jing. Such tales aside, so little is known of Lao Tzu that in records of the Grand Historian, completed around 94 BC, Sima Chen was unable to discover where the truth lay. By the 20th century, some academics doubted Lao Tzu's very existence. And while the Tao De Jing is variously dated to somewhere between the 6th and 4th centuries BC, the text bears many signs of later compilation, arousing debate among scholars. Can any evidence help to settle the question? In 1993, a tomb near Guojian in Hubei province yielded an important find. The Guozhen Chu slips were written in the state of Chu around 300 BC. Guozhen Chu, the time, the 
，实际上有质检只有七百三十字，《道德经》当中的一些基本的内容，在这个甲乙丙当中都都有都有体现。应该说，这个是真实的，能够说老子这个这个不存在，它不存在存不存在的问题，有没有的问题，因为只是说怎么把老子更进一步的深入的研究的问题。Tao Te Ching has always been regarded as a difficult book. It presents an elusive, abstract concept, Tao, often translated as the way. This means the way things truly are behind appearances, the source and sustenance of everything. It also means the way to live in conformity with the nature of reality. The essence of Tao is Wu Wei, literally not acting. The attitude required to achieve zen or harmony with nature. Thus, to follow the way means to understand and work with, rather than against, the grain of things. Man takes his law from the earth. Earth takes its law from heaven. Heaven takes its law from Tao. Tao is nature's way. Zhuangzi brought these Taoist abstractions vividly to life with his memorable parables. A contemporary of Mencius, though less engaged in worldly affairs, he lived from around 369 to 286 BC. On a hot summer day, a boy sleeps against a tree trunk. Intoxicated, Zhuangzi lies on a stone bench, exposing his chest. And snoring contentedly, a pair of butterflies sport above them. Zhuang Zhou dreaming of a butterfly, by the Yuan Dynasty master Liu Guandao, is based upon the Taoist philosopher's most famous anecdote. When he awoke, Zhuang Zhou famously wondered, "Which is the real me? Am I the man Zhuang Zhou who dreamed of turning into a butterfly, or the butterfly dreaming of becoming a man?" Zhang Zhe lived through the tumult of the late Warring States period, convinced of the individual's utter helplessness in such troubled times. He advocated the pursuit of spiritual freedom. He called withdrawal from the world by means of Wu Wei or inaction the advantage of being useless. Historian Zhang Chong Yu Wu studies Chinese philosophies from times prior to the Jin Dynasty. 要是我梦到的话，我都感到会会感到非常非常愉快的。他认为就是这种叫物化。什么叫物化呢？就是用物象的形式的一种变化。什么东西用物以物象的形式变化呢？是道，道就是世界的本源。我们这一切从哪儿来的呢？那个来源处叫道。第二个，道还有一个意义，就是我们世上的每一个事物，每一类事物。它的背后，决定它是什么那个东西，就是道。因为我们说高大上的时候，我们是站在一个角度说的；我们说卑贱的时候，我们也是站在一个角度说的。如果我们换了这个角度，换了这个位置，高大上还是高大上。Zhuang Zhe's hometown, Mengzheng, in Anhui Province. On the bridge over the Hao River, Zhuang Zhe and Hui Xi. Were watching the fish swimming. Zhuang Zhe sighed and said, "The minnows are darting about freely and easily. They are happy." Wu Xi replied, "You are not a fish. How do you know that?" Zhuang Zhe said, "You are not me. How do you know that I do not know that the fish are happy?" Wu Xi replied, "I am not you, so of course I don't know that. But you are obviously not a fish." So the case that you do not know that the fish are happy is closed. Wang Zhe said, "Let's go back to basics. In asking me how I know that the fish are happy, you must already have known that I knew it. I do know it right here, standing above the Hao River." This 2,000-year-old scene shows how slippery Wang Zhe's use of perspective could be. He was the most subtle thinker. But Hui Shi was the more famous master of logical argument.
Dreitzer admired Rishi as a man of many devices whose writings would fill five carriages. He belonged to the school of names, or the logicians. When Hui Shi was prime minister of the state of Hui, Jiang Yi, a member of the school of diplomacy, was strategist for the state of Qin. Hui Shi supported the vertical alliance that involved six of the other states. Jiang Yi launched the horizontal alliance strategy to disunite them. Though reputedly more learned than his rival, Hui Shi was outmaneuvered and fled from Hui in panic. A man once asked Hui Shi to explain why the sky does not fall, nor the earth cave in. His answer was not recorded, and most of his works have been lost. However, Zhang Tzu did preserve ten paradoxes of Hui Shi, which suggest the intriguing turn of his thinking. One such paradox, heaven is as low as the earth, mountains and marshes are on the same level, conceals a profound truth. Sky and earth meet at their interface, be it mountaintop or low marshland. Confucius had championed the rectification of names, the need to ensure that words, or names, had clear and correct meanings. This had significant philosophical, ritual, and political implications. During the Warring States period, Hui Shi and other scholars from the School of Names used paradox to investigate words and their meanings. Gong Sun Lung would pursue this line of inquiry. Han Valley Pass in Lingbao County, Henan Province. More than 2,300 years ago, Gong Sun Lung came here but was not treated as respectfully as Lao Tzu had been. He rode a white horse and was stopped outside the gate by the state of Qin's border guard. The horses of the state of Zhao were infected with a disease, so the state of Qin had posted a notice, Zhao's horses cannot enter the pass. The border guard said to him, you may enter the pass, but your horse cannot. Gong Sun Lung said, my white horse is not a horse, why can't it cross the border? The border guard said, the white horse is a horse. Referring to the meaning of his given name, Lung, Gong Sun Lung asked, then am I a dragon? He continued, white refers to a color, horse refers to the name of something. A thing is not the same as its color, so white horse is not horse. The border guard was flummoxed and let the horse and its rider pass. Whether or not this episode took place remains moot, but though his claim that white horse is not horse did make Gong Sun Lung famous, it is logical only to a point. The Chinese word for white is Bai, the word for horse is Ma and the word for white horse is Bai Ma. So clearly these three words differ. And anything can be white, but not anything can be a horse. So white and horse do refer to ideas of different kinds. But since in reality a white horse certainly is one type of horse, Gong Sun Lung's argument risks being mere sophistry. 在我们的历史上政治啊治理国家呀也是要说清楚的所以从这个意义上说名家会对政治有大用的可是当时的中国人没有认识到这个民间 district in Beijing once the ancient county of Yu Yang in the state of Yang It is said that one spring while in the service of King Zhao of Yan a Jisha scholar named Zhou Yin came to Mian. It was still wintry and the ground was as barren as the moon. The people were suffering great hardship. 
So on a mountain top in Mayun, he played the song of spring on his pipe for three days and nights. A warm wind sprang up, the sun shone, the snow melted, and the farmers hastened to sow. They would enjoy a bumper harvest. Zhou Yin found more fruitful seeds than those known locally and taught farmers how to identify and cultivate them. By using different farming methods, people's lives gradually improved and they built a Zota temple in his honor. After thousands of years, this once popular temple has left no trace. But the spirit of Zhou Yin may yet wander amidst the ever-changing light and nocturnal shadows of Shugu Mountain. This representative of the school of yin and yang has been called the real founder of Chinese scientific thought. Zhou Yen understood the influence of climate on agricultural production in terms of the principles of yin and yang combined with the doctrine of Wu Xin. Yin and yang are the two complementary forces of the universe. Wu Xin the theory of the five elements, metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. Their symbolic properties and interrelationships govern everything, including the fate of dynasties. Zhou Yen also believed that China was surrounded by eight other lands within a single continent, surrounded by a great ocean. Beyond the ocean, there's still more lands, beyond which was the horizon, where heaven and earth met. Zhou Yen's big world theory was only one part of this extraordinary polymath's conception of the world in which we live. Many of his ideas would remain influential in China for more than two millennia. On the 27th day of the 8th lunar month, Chinese people celebrate Confucius' birthday. The ceremony at the Confucius temple in his hometown, Kufu, is the most fervent of all. Sacrifices were first offered to Confucius in the 2nd century BC, during the Han dynasty. Since then, other Confucian figures called accompanying scholars have also been worshipped. Among them are 72 of Confucius' disciples, Mencius from the Warring States period, Dong Jungshu from the Han Dynasty, and Zhu Shi from the 12th century, early in the Southern Sun Dynasty. Their images either share the Dacheng Hall with Confucius or are placed in its east or west wings. However, when people dedicate burning incense to the master and his many sage followers, they may not notice that Chunzi, the great Confucian contemporary of Mencius, is not among them. Chunzi was the most famous scholar of his time and served as the head of the Disha Academy three times. However, Shunzi's statue is missing from the Confucius temple because his ideas diverged from Confucian doctrine. Though little recognized within the mainstream of Chinese thought, their influence has nonetheless been felt. Shunzi, or Shun Kuang, came from the state of Zhao. He turned to Confucianism during the Warring States period, one of the bloodiest epochs in Chinese history. This coloured his approach to Confucianism. Having witnessed the evil side of humanity, he took a pragmatic stance toward the idea of the rule of law. Mencius taught that human nature was inherently good and that this was the basis for upright behaviour. Shunzi argued that human nature was inherently evil. It was opportunistic, 
unscrupulous and pursued pleasure. Only through active effort to act with righteousness and by observing legal restrictions can one become good. So propriety and law are the essence of governance and rulers should make good use of them. Tianli Although many of Shunsa's views were not accepted by other Confucianists, much of his thinking remained rooted in Confucianism. But unlike the vigorous ginkgo growing in the Confucius temple's garden, the seeds of his unorthodox ideas would germinate elsewhere. Shunzi and his students have been criticized by Confucianists for thousands of years. Yet his two most famous disciples changed the course of China's history. They provided a theoretical and practical basis for ruling in accordance with established practices, or what we would call the rule of law. Their names are Li Xi and Han Fei. Han Fei was an aristocrat from the state of Han. His thinking, like Shunzi's, also drew ideas from various schools. However, he abandoned the Confucian notions of propriety and righteousness. Instead, he became the leading light of the legalists prior to the establishment of the Qin dynasty. Han Fei believed that even legendary sages, such as Yao and Shun, could not govern well without laws. And even tyrants like King Zhe of Sha and King Zhou of Shang would not ruin the state when constrained by the law. But sages are hardly met with in a hundred years, and tyrants are rare. Most rulers are ordinary men. A mediocre king who rules by the law is like a craftsman who merely follows the rules, but both will do well enough. Han Fei advocated absolute monarchy over disempowered vassals, the use of law specialists, clear legislation that was enforced, and the prohibition of private learning. Punishment and reward were the ruler's two tools, agriculture and warfare the basis of the state's prosperity. Uh Legalists of the warring states period opposed freedom of thought, but were themselves a product of the hundred schools of thought. They thought deeply about nature, human nature, politics and society, and formulated novel, yet valuable, theoretical views. More importantly, legalist political practice would become an effective technique for governing the state. It would also fuel the rise of later dynasties, providing future rulers with clear lessons on which to ponder and to act. During the Axial Age, China not only saw contention between often divergent schools of thought, 
but also a convergence of opinions. Scholars held many different views, refuting, supporting, and influencing each other. The term a hundred schools only slightly overstates the situation. But the immense importance of their contention cannot be exaggerated. The Jisha Academy, once a grand establishment with high doors and high ideals, was destroyed when the state of Yan sacked the city of Linse in 284 BC. More than 2,000 years later, only soil remains. But such soil once nourished a wonderful era of scholarship whose legacy endures. Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of the Qin dynasty, would burn books and reportedly bury alive hundreds of Confucian scholars and ban private schools. Emperor Wu of Han exalted Confucianism over all other schools of thought. But the glory of the hundred schools of the Warring States period would shine out across the ages. Its philosophical and cultural heritage is preserved in the classics handed down to us. These ideas have continued to influence China's broad, profound, rich and colorful culture, shaping the nation's history and its future.